another interesting thing I that always strikes me is the somewhat mirror image quality of these two lakes. Each of them has a limestone peninsula made of Niagara and Dolomite, the Bruce Peninsula here, the Door Peninsula here in Wisconsin, and then a large bay. This is Green Bay. This is Georgian Bay, significantly larger. And this same uh, area of Niagara and Dolomite limestone comes back and forms the um, the uh, <clears throat> barrier that Niagara Falls is uh, flowing over and cutting back through. Uh, we also see some effects of glaciation here in the Finger Lakes region of New York. Um, following our water flow uh, once again, there is the St. Clair River, which comes from the south end of Lake Huron through shallow Lake St. Clair, and then the Detroit River as it flows past Detroit into very shallow western Lake Erie and on through Lake Erie through the Niagara system and uh, then on into Lake Ontario and out through the St. Lawrence to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, <clears throat> Jim, this is Melissa. Can I ask you one question? Yes. If you can, are you, are you using the pointer on the on your presentation or on the Adobe Connect. I don't think people are seeing when you're when you're pointing to things. I'm using my mouse on my screen, so if I'm showing you my screen on Adobe Connect, I'm hoping it comes through. Oh, now let's see. Okay, I can. That's me moving the pointer. So okay. If you can, you see that little pointer button up at the top of the the screen? Do you have that option? I am not sure. I'm I'm make, so where would it be? There's um, draw, a pointer, stop sharing, and full screen. Okay, I found the. I, top. All right, now how do I get it to move though? Oh, okay, I can, I can move. There you it. go. Now we're seeing it. Okay. All right. Well, let me go back. Okay. Thank so, you. So I thank you. I need to drag it with my with my mouse on this end, right? Um, so this is the St. Mary's River here. Um, the Dora Peninsula that I mentioned, the Bruce Peninsula. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, Georgian Bay, Green Bay. This is the St. Clair River, Lake St. Clair, the Detroit River, through Lake Erie, on through the Niagara River system, and on out through Lake Ontario to the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and I mentioned the Ottawa River before, so this is the Ottawa here which provided that water passage uh, up into Lake Huron. Uh, <clears throat> residence time is something that you run into uh, in the oceans uh, in terms of uh, various kinds of nutrients and things that are there. I thought I would mention residence time just briefly here for these lakes uh, because they are very different. It's, a, um, it's an integrated system but unique characteristics. Um, in Lake Superior, the residence time is approximately 200 years. So by residence time, I mean an average molecule of water spends about 200 years. Now, lots of stuff comes in and goes out very quickly. Lots of stuff stays for a lot longer. But residence time in Superior is about 200 years. In Michigan, it's about 100. In Huron, it's about 20. In Ontario, about 8. And in Lake Erie, about two and a half years. So Lake Erie exchanges approximately 40% of its overall volume um, quantity about once a year. So very, very unique characteristics uh, of difference between these lakes. Uh, I was talking about limnology, and uh, we use large vessels, research vessels, like you do on the ocean. This is the 180-foot US EPA <coughs> Lake Guardian. And uh, the equipment that we use, the uh, uh, techniques that are used, the, uh, the technology, all of those kinds of things are very, very similar, if not identical, uh, to the ocean for sampling water. Uh, and I'll show you some, uh, some critter sampling in just a moment. This is a rosette sampler. Um, the thing that struck me, I was out on the Lake Guardian in Lake Huron uh, this past summer. And we were lowering the rosette sampler into Lake Huron. I'm not sure how far down into the water that is, but 
I can't recall ever seeing water that blue in the Great Lakes. And it's part of the ecosystem changes that are occurring. And you'll hear more about those things in a uh, subsequent presentation. Um, more different kinds of sampling equipment, plankton sampling, benthic sampling equipment, and of course, lots of lab analysis. <clears throat> What I've added now to our overview is the Great Lakes drainage basin. So you see the, uh, the blue water. And uh, now I've lost my pointer because it's sitting there in that green somewhere, but it's OK. Um, <clears throat> the blue water is there. And um, the green around that blue water is the rim of the bowl, if you will, that drains into those lakes. So the lakes are the bottom of the bowl running on out toward the Atlantic Ocean. And the thing that is striking about the size of this bowl is really how small it is in comparison to a drainage basin like that of the Mississippi River. This is something approximately 300,000 square miles. And perhaps even more striking is the fact that almost 100,000 square miles of that is water. Uh, so a lot of what has an impact or an effect on the Great Lakes actually is directly upon the surface of that water, whether it's evaporation coming off, precipitation falling on, or um, particulates and contaminants falling onto the, uh, uh, the surface of those lakes. And you might notice also that down in the lower left, uh, where you see Milwaukee and Chicago, the basin is very, very narrow. Um, it's, it's probably the narrowest of any place on the, uh, on the map, except perhaps uh, in New York, just uh, near the Pennsylvania border there. It's also quite narrow. Uh, so a lot of the water that goes into uh, Lake Michigan and Lake Huron doesn't come from places like Milwaukee, where the basin is, is quite narrow. Um, and we will come back to, uh, to talk a little bit more about this later. Land drainage area, you can see from this that the uh, largest amount of drainage is in Lake Huron, uh, followed by Lake Superior, Lake Michigan. And um, those uh, three drainage basins uh, account for probably 75% of the overall drainage uh, into those lakes. We can also look at population. Population is significant because as population increases, it's usually an indication of urbanization. And um, along with urbanization, industrialization, uh, we have noted that a lot of things that have an impact on those lakes, which for years, like the oceans, have been used as dumping grounds, uh, a lot of the activities that go on along those shorelines and in the basin have a significant impact. So the more people uh, and the more concentration of people, the more impact on things like erosion, uh, siltation, changes in channels, uh, emptying of sewage effluent, uh, use of water, all of those kinds of things. And you can see that from 1900 uh, through uh, about 1985, uh, which is the last census data I've gotten on this graph, Lake Superior population far to the north hasn't changed very much, which is also true of Lake Huron. Uh, but notice that you know, population along Lake Ontario, especially in the uh, US side, I believe, has gone up uh, somewhat significantly. And there's been steady, steady increase and significant increase in both Lakes Michigan and, um, and Erie. And if we look at a uh, population distribution map, you can see where most of the people live. Most of the people live around the southern half of Lake Michigan, which is a cul-de-sac, so things tend to stay there, and also around um, the two lowest lakes, Erie and Ontario. This happens to be Toronto, and a significant portion of the Canadian population lives here uh, in Toronto, especially the population of Ontario. Um, now, you may remember when I talked about residence time, these are the smallest lakes. Lake Erie is the shallowest of the lakes with an average depth of something less than uh, 100 feet. 
with a, a maximum depth of uh, just over 200, as I recall. Whereas Lake Michigan has a depth of about 925 and Superior is about 1,300. So the ability of something like Lake Superior to absorb um, the effects of industrialization, urbanization, uh, agricultural development uh, significantly greater because of its much, much larger volume. In fact, half of the water that's in this entire system is in Lake Superior. So these larger upper lakes uh, have historically had a bit of an advantage in terms of absorbing some of the uh, effects of urbanization, industrialization, and agricultural development. Not so the lower lakes, especially Lake Erie, and as I mentioned, this is a cul-de-sac, so our southern end of Lake Michigan tends to be a little bit more uh, vulnerable also. Uh, if we look at the system in profile, um, <clears throat> what you can see is that the water level in Lake Superior is about 600 feet above sea level, it drops about 25 feet to the level of Michigan. Uh, Huron, a little bit through the St. Clair system, uh, so that by the time you get to Niagara Falls, uh, the water level has fallen uh, about another eight feet from Michigan Huron, and then it's about uh, 325 feet, as I recall, over Niagara Falls and through the Niagara River system to about 240 feet above sea level in Lake Ontario, and then on down through the St. Lawrence uh, with the area at Montreal actually being the place where the last lock and dam is. And all of this then is estuarine. The uh, tidal imp uh, influence of the Atlantic Ocean uh, can extend all the way up uh, to Montreal at times. Uh, <clears throat> I think one of the things that I find interesting is that the drop from the far end of Lake Huron, which, or I'm sorry, Lake Michigan, which is Chicago, all the way to Buffalo, which is out here, is only about eight feet. Our uh, water levels and the supply of water that we have is greatly influenced by a balance between what comes in and goes out, what comes in by precipitation, and what goes out by evaporation. And we're finding that more and more of the uh, evaporation uh, term is really significant in terms of our uh, affecting our lake levels. So the water budget for these lakes depends on uh, water that comes in from rivers and streams outside, water that falls directly on the surface of the lake uh, as precipitation, and then also evaporation. So water flows from Lake Superior uh, into the upper uh, Michigan and Huron lakes, and so that's also an influence on um, water levels as, uh, as that water cycle moves through those lakes. And of course, uh, since much of our water uh, level, or our water supply, really, is dependent upon precipitation, um, the, the water cycle, the evaporation that uh, comes off of the oceans and feeds the um, weather systems that come across the Midwest and the Great Lakes, is really very, very important in terms of determining how much moisture we get and when we get that moisture. And I mentioned water levels. Um, I'm going to focus just on Michigan-Huron right now. Remember I said they go up and down together. And uh, what you see in this graph starting about 1865 is that water levels tended to be higher in this time period. Um, the 35 years of the uh, 19th century when a lot of development was going on, especially right in here, a lot of mining of sand, dredging of channels for shipping. And so after about this time, water levels dropped and sort of established a new equilibrium. And then uh, after about 1920 or so, uh, the graph gets a little bit noisier. Uh, and if we look at the 20th century, we see that record low water levels for Michigan-Huron 
actually occurred here in 1964-65. Record water levels, uh, high water levels occurred in 1986. So we have water level issues in the same way that global change is causing water level issues along our ocean coasts. Uh, our water level issues are, are a little bit different and I'll talk, I hope, a little bit more about that um, in just a little bit. Um, what you can also see on this map is that there's an annual cycle. The lakes go up and down about a foot each year from a summertime maximum, so our spring rains, our snow melt feeds water supply into those lakes and so water levels tend to rise uh, through about July and then uh, there's more evaporation, there's uh, less precipitation and so water levels tend to fall again by about a foot back toward a low coming up in uh, a month or two from now, usually end of January, early February. Uh, <clears throat> and so that seasonal cycle occurs in all of the lakes. If we take a quick look at Lake Superior, you can see that levels tend to be um, much more stable and it's because there is some uh, compensation or adjustment on the flow of the St. Mary's River. Uh, I call your attention to, since this map only goes up to about the year 2000, or this graph, I would call your attention to this line here, which is 576 feet above sea level, um, and where that February uh, low in 1964, January low in 64 was, it was at about 576 feet. We have been in something of a significant drought here, and that 576 foot level is, let's see, 575.5, five, uh, it's right about here. 576 is right about here, and we are predicted uh, to get quite close to that um, again this, uh, this winter. Uh, this is the prediction here. It's come up a little bit. At one time, they were actually predicting that we would be down here. And that has significance for lots of things. It reduces erosion along the shoreline, but it has impacts on shipping. It has impacts on the integrity of uh, actually buildings that are set on wooden pilings in places along river systems like the Milwaukee. Uh, so water levels that are too low uh, tend to reduce the amount of cargo and the amount of uh, transportation that we can do on the lakes, just as it's doing on the Mississippi right now. Uh, water levels that are too high, such as we saw back in the, uh, the mid-80s, water levels uh, up in this area, very, very significant in terms of erosion uh, to shore property owners, to wetlands, to, uh, to river channels, all of those kinds of things. I thought I'd talk a little bit about some of the, um, the properties of water and how we in, in freshwater look at uh, some of the physical principles. Uh, as many of you probably know, water is an anomalous uh, substance, and it's lucky for us that it is, I guess. Water reaches its maximum density at just under 4 degrees C. Uh, so above that point, it is expanding, and below that point, it is also expanding. So um, the heaviest fresh water is at uh, just under 4 degrees C. And that has significance for uh, circulation, for uh, wintertime stratification, for mixing uh, in the spring and the fall. Uh, <clears throat> and I want to look a little bit more at that with this particular graph. This is really smaller lakes as opposed to the Great Lakes, but I will try to make some, uh, uh, some comparisons for you. This is a wintertime condition uh, under ice cover. This is a spring and fall condition where, for the most part, winds are strong enough to mix lakes from top to bottom. And this certainly occurs in most of the Great Lakes, at least to date. Uh, there is some concern as uh, temperatures warm and as lakes absorb more heat uh, that this particular overturn may not always happen in some of our Great Lakes 
which will have an impact on, on the ecology. And then this is the summertime condition when um, <clears throat> stratification occurs. And I'll show you a graphic of stratification in, in just a bit. But let's look at a couple of the things that this sort of a pattern affects. Uh, if we look at the wintertime condition, we can see uh, water at zero, water at four degrees, the heaviest water, and that water at four degrees, it's almost uh, isothermal from just below the ice all the way down uh, to the bottom. And in the Great Lakes, especially something like Lake Michigan, very large, um, if there is not significant ice cover, uh, that water, that four degree water, if it exists, is going to be near the bottom, but there may be enough wind throughout the winter to actually mix that lake from top to bottom, and so it might get a little bit colder even than four degrees C. You can see in smaller lakes that also has an impact on the amount of oxygen that's there, and so very close to the bottom you may get low levels of oxygen, which will affect the critters that live there. In the spring and the fall, one of the things that's really, really very important is this overturn, this bringing up of nutrients that have settled into this deep lower lake, this hyperlimnion, bringing those nutrients back up into the surface waters. And that fuels a spring bloom of uh, algae, which in turn feeds the ecosystem for the rest of the, uh, the season. And at the same time, that overturn or that mixing, even throughout the winter, uh, allows this whole body of water to become oxygenated, well oxygenated, with, a, uh, uh, with that cold temperature, those waters holding a lot of, uh, of oxygen. If we look at the summertime condition, uh, we can see warm temperatures at the surface. We can see uh, a an epilimnion, an upper warmer lake, uh, extending down um, perhaps tens of meters in some cases, especially as the season goes on. And then we see a transition zone where temperature falls rather rapidly until we get down to, in the Great Lakes, something perhaps close to four degrees uh, C. It depends upon how much heat has actually been stored in the summertime and how much it's been able to give up over the winter. One of the things that makes the, uh, the lakes significant for us in terms of climate and climate modification is that um, the lakes are slow to heat up, but once they do absorb that heat, because water has such a high specific heat, they hold that temperature and they moderate our, uh, our climate, especially right along the shoreline. Um, we have a major winter storm moving into this area of the world uh, in the next day or two. And uh, they're predicting, for those of us here in Milwaukee, quite a bit of this storm will be rain as opposed to snow. And one of the reasons for that is because we get the, uh, the little bit of extra heat from Lake Michigan as the winds come across that lake uh, and keep, uh, keep the snow away from us and give us some, uh, some rain instead. Notice also that in a small lake like this, um, you can lose oxygen. And so much of this hyperlimnion can actually become um, hypoxic or near hypoxic, uh, limiting the amount of critters that can live there. In the largest of the Great Lakes, the deepest of the Great Lakes, we very rarely experience that kind of oxygen depletion, even throughout the summer. So that cold oxygen with that large volume tends to keep, um, keep the oxygen levels pretty healthy. We're not so sure that that will continue, especially in our smaller lakes. And we are seeing some instances in places in Lake Erie uh, that do seem to show some, uh, some summertime depletion of oxygen. Uh, and here's that stratification, simple stratification diagram I was talking about. Uh, so the epilimnion with almost constant warm temperature down to an area where uh, density changes along with uh, temperature changes, uh, and then stabilizing and uh, pretty much isothermal temperatures uh, down through the hypolimnion. So like oceans, we have density differences that set up these, these layers or these clines, if you will. Um, uh, it's not salt. 
but it is it is temperature in this case. And throughout the summer, this epilimnion is pretty much isolated from the hyperlimnion by the metalimnion or the thermocline region. And what that means is that nutrients that have been fed into this upper body of water here, uh, once stratification sets up, there's not a lot more um, nutrient recycling up here in the epilimnion, and there's not much more addition of oxygen down here into this area. So the nutrients get used up, and then it's only what falls in uh, or flows in that may add to a little bit of a bloom. And down here, you hope that oxygen levels hold so that the critters that live there can continue to do so. Um, once the uh, lake starts to cool and the thermocline deepens, then the stage is set for more mixing. Uh, in terms of, uh, of chemistry, we have the same sorts of issues in the Great Lakes as you do in the oceans. Uh, there are lots and lots of elements that are found uh, in those lakes. Uh, some of them much more important than others. We don't have probably all of the trace elements that you find in, in oceans, but certainly in terms of fueling plant growth, um, we need to have phosphorus, nitrogen. Um, silica can be an important nutrient for, excuse me, for diatoms. Uh, <clears throat> so nutrient levels and measuring those nutrient levels uh, is important for us as well. And then we also have the concept of a limiting nutrient. Something is always going to run out first. Um, and in fresh water, not exclusively, but in fresh water, the limiting nutrient is often thought to be phosphorus. Now, there are some situations that are nitrogen limited. There may be uh, some situations that are limited by other nutrients as well. We know that diatoms need silica, and so silica levels are important for diatom population growth. Oceans are often nitrogen limited, and as I said, some of our systems are nitrogen limited, at least at times in the Great Lakes. But most of the time, it's phosphorus, and so phosphorus control um, through phosphorus detergent regulation and wastewater treatment plant uh, modernization and upgrade has really been important in terms of controlling levels of phosphorus into these lakes. Uh, a couple of quick looks. Uh, this data goes back a bit, but relatively speaking, uh, probably uh, if, if you don't pay too much attention to the numbers, uh, most of these graphs are probably still relatively good, and I'll, I'll point out some of the uh, anomalies. So uh, if we look at chloride, and most of the time chloride is coming from either wastewater treatment plant effluent or significantly from road salt. Um, a lot of our area uses uh, significant quantities of salt. That salt travels over the lakes by water, but it also leaves our streets, our highways, uh, sidewalks, etc., by water, and so it's going into the nearest receiving waters and into the Great Lakes. So, um, Superior with its low population, low chloride levels, and as you get more people and smaller bodies of water, chloride levels tend to rise. Uh, this is transparency, so using a Secchi, dip, a Secchi disk to measure transparency depth. Uh, again, this goes back uh, 20 years. And as you can see from Superior on down through Huron, Michigan, uh, Erie, and Ontario, you've got a decline uh, <clears throat> in the amount of transparency. So you can't see the Secchi depth, uh, Secchi disk as far down into the lake. Now, in talking to uh, Carmen a little bit earlier in the day, and based on my remark uh, about the blue water in Lake Huron, if we were to look at Lake Huron and Lake Michigan today, these levels would probably be very, very similar to Secchi depths in Lake Superior. Um, we, had, uh, we had certainly Secchi depths uh, approaching 20 meters in Lake Huron, open Lake Huron in the summer uh, this, past, uh, this past season. So Secchi depths are getting deeper transparency is increasing, and most of that is due to an invasive species, uh, the dry mussels. 
chlorophyll, which is an indication of algal production. Uh, you can see that, uh, again, from Superior with, with little impact uh, of human population, right on down through the smallest lakes, you can see the impact of some of the things that go on along the shoreline, uh, increasing plant uh, or algal production um, in those bodies of water. And actually, these numbers are probably, these levels have probably come down a bit. There's probably less uh, chlorophyll being produced uh, at this point in time because of, again, the ecosystem changes that are caused by invasives like zebra mussels. And this is silica. Uh, and again, we may also see some increase here in uh, silica levels in Michigan and Huron because diatom populations are down. And so that would remove less silica from those lakes. And so silica levels, uh, again, according to a conversation I had with Carmen, um, silica levels are coming up. Well, I've been talking a little bit about um, some of these <clears throat> nutrients and chemical parameters. Uh, really what we've got is a perturbed ecology, perturbed uh, relative to a lot of the uh, invasive species that are there, the zebra mussels, uh, which are coating this cart, spiny water flea, uh, round goby. This is a, an alewife, sea lamprey on a lake trout. So it's a perturbed ecology. We've got 180 invasive species that have established themselves. They compete with native species for all sorts of things. They prey on uh, eggs, larvae, and young. They alter the habitat. And you can see that um, the largest number of, uh, or largest type of these invasives is plants. But very quickly, we get into fish, algae, mollusks, and I guess, what, well, we have some pathogens on here, viruses and things like that. How do they get in here? Well, the largest pathway is via ships. But we also have the aquarium trade, uh, the live fish food trade. Um, <clears throat> we have canals that have opened up, pathways, uh, the uh, Welland Canal around Niagara Falls. We'll talk a little bit more about some of these pathways in just a bit. And once they get into the Great Lakes, uh, we move them around via uh, our own ships, our own boats from one body of water to the other. Traditionally, historically, oceans, the uh, high salt concentration of oceans formed a natural barrier to the movement of a lot of these things, as did waterfalls like Niagara Falls. Uh, pollution was a barrier. Uh, and, and as you can see, we're bypassing uh, a lot of these things by improving water quality, by building canals around those natural barriers, uh, and ships are moving uh, with ballast water from all over the planet, really. Ships are moving uh, from place to place and taking species from one place to another. Uh, a lot of our invasive species have come from this Ponto-Caspian region, the Black Sea, the Caspian Sea. And then over time, uh, the waterways of Europe were interconnected. We visit ports in, even in northern Europe and we come into the Great Lakes with those, uh, those ships bringing lots of things that are hitching along in ballast water, dumping them into the lakes, some of which become established. And then we truck them around, ship them around here in the Great Lakes. Um, this is a, a graphic showing the commercial activity of one ship over a 14-month period. Now, obviously, it didn't go across the land, but uh, it visited all of those ports in a 14-month period. And so movement of invasive species, as I'm sure many of you realize, is not a, um, a problem that's unique to the Great Lakes. We are homogenizing ecosystems all over the planet. And that really changes ecosystems, changes ecological stability. Um, it's not a healthy situation to move things from San Francisco Bay to uh, Sydney Harbor and Sydney Harbor to uh, Tokyo or Hong Kong in very, very short order. Uh, a little bit about nutrients and nutrient cycling. And I'm not going to talk very much about this, because Carmen and Russell are going to get into this in much more detail. 
but I wanted to show you just a little bit of this. Um, this is Clodophora, which is a, an alga that has been in the Great Lakes for quite some time. Not considered to be an invasive, but it has been a nuisance in the past. Once again, it's becoming a nuisance. Clodophora needs a hard substrate to attach to. Uh, it needs nutrients like phosphorus. It has a preferred uh, amount of light and a preferred amount of temperature, uh, and that allows it to grow. What we found with uh, invasive species like the drysinid mussels, the zebras and the quaggas, they are affecting the, the way nutrients are supplied to critters like Clodophora. They are affecting the amount of light and the depth to which light can penetrate. And so Clodophora is becoming something of an issue. Uh, I think I'm going to flip through this very, very quickly. I'm not, I thought I had taken these out of here, and I guess I didn't. Um, so rather than spend a lot of time, I'm going to let Carmen and Russell do this next time. And I apologize for having them still in there. But one of the things that zebra mussels do is to clear the algal particles out of water. And this is uh, a before picture. Uh, with a control and zebra mussels. This is an after picture, again, with a control. Uh, this is the a um, after picture with a control. This is the control here. Zebra mussels here, zebra mussels after. And you can see that in just 30 minutes, these zebra mussels have been able to clear virtually all of the particles out of there. That leads to clear water. And clear is not necessarily clean. It is not necessarily even good in this particular case, because it allows sunlight to penetrate further. It allows water to heat up uh, a little bit more. And it changes where the nutrients are in that body of water. So this is a shot, underwater shot. You can see some rocks in the background, perhaps, uh, with some sediment on them. Before zebra mussels, this is after zebra mussels. And you can see that nutrients have been settled out. Light is a lot more prevalent and Clodophora uh, has taken over. Now, that was zebra mussels. Quagga mussels have changed this picture even a little further. We can see it in looking at the transparency in our harbor area here in the Milwaukee area and in many other places. The distance, the depth to which we can see that secchi disk has been going up dramatically. And again, that's a function of Zebra mussels, it's also to some extent a function of the fact that we're doing a better job of uh, allowing uh, or preventing, I should say, siltation and things coming in from upstream. But it's really, in large part, related to the mussel invasion. And Clodophora has once again become a nuisance along our shoreline with large mats of this Clodophora building up, washing on shore, and uh, it really has become a uh, a rotting mess that is putting a lot of people off and limiting the use of our beaches. Well, this gives me an opportunity to introduce Carmen and Russell uh, just a bit. And I know I'm, uh, I'm right at about um, the end of the hour, but uh, cut me off if you want to. But I'm hoping I've got about another five minutes or so. Oh, OK. Good. OK. I, yep. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> so this is uh, Dr. Russell Kuehl, Dr. Carmen Aguilar, both scientists here at uh, the School of Freshwater Science. And uh, they, they work on a lot of uh, different issues that relate to limnology, nutrients, and uh, critter biology out there. And uh, this, um, they'll talk a little bit more about quagga mussels and the nutrient interactions uh, related to those quagga mussels. But you can see here in 94, 95, when we had lots of zebra mussels, we had very, very spotty indications of quaggas. And in just a 10-year period, quaggas have really taken over uh, and outcompeted zebra mussels, especially here in the southern part of Lake Michigan and in other parts of the Great Lakes system. Uh, so they're, again, causing new changes to our ecosystem. One of the... Uh, organisms that's been affected is a small shrimp-like critter, an amphipod, that lives in the bottom of uh, Lake Michigan and the other Great Lakes. A very uh, nutritious critter that was 
uh, forage, food, for lots of the fish that spent at least a portion of their time near the bottom of the lake. And you can see how dramatically numbers have declined uh, over just a 10-year uh, a period. And those numbers continue to decline, 94% uh, according to a scientist in Michigan. And you see here that um, <clears throat> the fish numbers have also been declining over that uh, over a period of time because the fish do not have as much to eat, as much nutritious food to eat with some of the invasions that have occurred. Uh, this is one of our uh, our favorite perch, or our favorite fish rather in this area was the yellow perch. And yellow perch populations uh, at one time were extremely significant in terms of a commercial harvest. And uh, back in the early 90s, populations collapsed dramatically. Uh, <clears throat> and remember that this was a time when zebra mussels were uh, rather in their heyday and quagga mussels were just coming in uh, in large numbers in this area as well. A little bit of a resurgence. But numbers, again, went down in the early part of uh, the last decade. So fish like yellow perch and uh, other fish that are native to the Great Lakes are suffering stress because of those invasives. The uh, next invasive on the uh, agenda, really, is the Eurasian carp. Uh, <clears throat> the last uh, talk in this sequence, this series, uh, is going to address some of the policy issues. And, and so I'm now actually starting to get into some of those, uh, those areas that also affect policy just a bit, just to give you a little bit of a taste for it. Uh, the Eurasian carp is a species that uh, the big head and the silver were introduced in the southern Mississippi Valley uh, for the aquaculture trade, the aquaculture industry. And so those fish escaped in a flood and were able to move up the Mississippi now, the Mississippi drainage basin historically was separate from the Great Lakes drainage basin. Uh, and so historically, fish moving up the Mississippi drainage basin would not have been able to transit into the Great Lakes. But one of the canals that we built was in the Chicago area. I think I have a little better uh, image here. <clears throat> Let me go back to this earlier slide and remember I pointed out, um, oh, hang on, I got to find my pointer. There it is. Let me move it over here. OK. Uh, this area of, uh, of the Great Lakes drainage basin is very, very narrow. And in fact, uh, it doesn't even exist really as part of a drainage basin anymore because Chicago reversed the flow of its Chicago River which at one time flowed into the lake. And in order to prevent their sewage effluent from going into their source of drinking water, and I guess I didn't mention, since these are fresh waters, we drink the waters of these lakes all the time. Millions and millions, tens of millions of people drink the waters of the Great Lakes um, every day. So Chicago gets its drinking water from southern Lake Michigan. In order to prevent putting its sewage effluent into that source of drinking water, they breached the subcontinental divide, put a canal in place, and their sewage effluent then went down the uh, Ship and Sanitary Canal into the Illinois River system, ultimately to the Mississippi. And you can see more of that right here. There was several branches of the Chicago River flowing into Lake Michigan. There's now a lock and dam here. Uh, this is the Ship and Sanitary Canal. And there's another canal connection here into the Calumet River system. And this is an area where they have established a barrier, an electric curtain, if you will, that is supposed to prevent um, invasives like the Big Head and Silver Carp from moving through and getting up into the Great Lakes, adding yet another invasive species that could have significant impact on the ecosystem of the Great Lakes. The policy issue is, will that barrier or other approaches that are barrier-like actually do the job, or is it likely to be breached? And if so, perhaps we should 
separate once again this canal, this system here, from the Chicago River system. It's controversial because barge traffic brings goods through that canal system from the Great Lakes to the Mississippi and, uh, and the other way as well. So economically, it's a very, very important issue. It also relates to how Chicago disposes of its wastewater. Uh, and I thought I would mention climate change just a bit. Um, these three graphics here, there are actually three images of Lake Michigan, one of them in an El Nino year uh, showing chlorophyll production, and then these two are non-El Nino years. You can see that climate effects, uh, climate events affect uh, <clears throat> large bodies of water like the Great Lakes. Uh, we are seeing changes in the Great Lakes as we are in all parts of the planet, I think. Our winters are warmer by almost 4 degrees in the last 30 years. Our ice coverage has decreased. We have a longer growing season. And if we look at the next graphic, what we can see is that our air temperatures and our water temperatures are rising. And the amount of ice cover and the duration of that ice cover is actually declining. So we are already seeing impacts from climate. And we are concerned about future impacts of climate um, in the next uh, 80 years, uh, 75 years. It's predicted that our summertime climate here in Wisconsin, and so throughout much of the upper Midwest, is going to look more like Arkansas. I'm not sure that that's a good prospect, but uh, we're going to see drops in lake levels, probably due to increased warming and uh, increased evaporation. We're going to see increased precipitation, but that's not necessarily going to lead to higher lake levels. If lake levels drop, we have an economic impact because of less cargo that we can carry on the Great Lakes. There's another policy issue. Uh, if we have increased precipitation, especially if it's spottier, flashier, we have policy issues that relate to how do we handle stormwater? What do we do with agricultural runoff that may increase? Um, and then this whole increased air and water temperature, reduced ice cover, which probably has effects on human health, uh, certainly on energy usage, uh, increased air conditioning usage, etc. And one of the other issues is, do we divert, can we divert our fresh drinking water from the Great Lakes drainage basin um, to other parts of, uh, of the continent that are not in the Great Lakes drainage basin. And I mentioned that the basin was not very wide in the Milwaukee area. We already have a community to the west of us um, by about 15 miles, Waukesha, which is uh, in a county that adjoins and is in the Great Lakes drainage basin, but the city itself is not. They are requesting permission from the Great Lakes governors to divert water from the Great Lakes, from Lake Michigan, to, uh, to their city, and then they would return their effluent back to Lake Michigan. Uh, their water supply is threatened by uh, um, deepening aquifers, uh, aquifers that are being drawn down and getting into both saline water and radium. And I'm pretty sure the last presentation is going to talk about uh, some of that as well. So. With that, well, that's not bad. That's just about an hour. So uh, I'm going to turn it back over to you and uh, and thank everyone for their uh, for their participation and and tell you that we're looking forward to seeing people here in Milwaukee in April. Okay. Well, thank you, Jim. Um, I think that was actually a really good primer, sort of on both. In the biology, the physics, the chemistry, the geology, everything about the Great Lakes. Um, so I know we have a few uh, questions that have popped up during your presentation, which I'll read out in a minute. But um, just so all the attendees know, this is your time to ask Jim any question about his presentation, um, or if there's something that you, you might want to know about the Great Lakes that he may not have covered, um, this is your chance. So. Um, Russell, when you were discussing your chemistry section, um, he had asked, you know, does chloride also come from the erosion and groundwater? 
when you were discussing the amount of chloride in the, lake, the Great Lakes? Well, <clears throat> there, there may be some of that, but, but I've always heard that the, uh, the primary sources of, uh, of chloride, uh, at least of increasing chloride, would be wastewater uh, effluent uh, and uh, the, uh, the road salt that we use. Now, certainly there, is, uh, there are salt deposits in the Great Lakes, and there's probably some uh, uh, natural uh, chloride uh, uh, that gets eroded into the system. But those levels over time, well, with, with increased erosion, they might have gone up. But uh, um, you know, that's probably a, uh, a relatively relatively established baseline, if you will, that hasn't gone up rather dramatically. It's, it's more the road salt and the, uh, the urbanization, uh, wastewater treatment effluent effect, I think, that is causing the increase. Not the only source, though. Um, what are the nitrogen levels like? How do they compare in each of the Great Lakes? Uh, <clears throat> I don't know the answer to that. OK. <laughs> Russell may Russell may be able to add that uh, to his presentation. I think he he's going to be in a better position um, to do that than me. Okay. Um, another question was: How many invasive species are in Lake Michigan that haven't been found yet? So I guess would you have an idea of how many there might be that aren't necessarily counted? This is an unknown unknown. I guess. Uh, <laughs> Uh, also another question from Russell. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, if we if we haven't found them yet, how would we know? Uh, certainly, though, there there may well be things that are not in uh, uh, th that we haven't seen yet. One of the things that we're just now getting a better handle on, I think, are some of the uh, the microbes, the bacteria, the viruses. Uh, we haven't looked for those things. Uh, in great detail, and there are probably any number of invasives that are small. The uh, the fish and the crustaceans, the uh, the larger plants, those things are easier to find, easier to see. And if we have the small stuff, the microbes, um, um, some of the disease organisms, we wouldn't know that until we actually start seeing some effects. Okay. Um. What caused the slight yellow perch recovery um, around the year 2000? Well, a couple of things, uh, management decisions were made. Um, they essentially stopped commercial fishing for yellow perch. So that reduced fishing pressure from the commercial standpoint. They also reduced the bag limit for sport fishing. And that also decreased the, uh, the pressure. The, uh, the cause of the collapse of the yellow perch fishery was evidently somehow related to recruitment into the population. And the, one of the thoughts was that commercial fishing was taking out a lot of the largest size fish, which tended to be the females, before they had a chance to, uh, uh, to reproduce. But also ecosystem changes were going on such that those yellow perch, the, the fingerlings that, or I should say, the sack fry that hatched out, um, there was a good population. They think of uh, those sack fry from the remaining um, perch population, adult perch population that was there. But somehow, those little fish got lost, got consumed, uh, or something took them out of the population before they could once again be large enough that they were sampled. So they were not making it very, very far into, into life before they got taken out by something in the system. OK. Um, another participant was asking, are dead zones a problem in the Great Lakes? Dead zones are something of a problem and a, uh, a concern, as I understand it. In places like Lake Erie, especially shallow western Lake Erie, which is only about 30 feet deep at its maximum, and you get out into the central basin, parts of that are also um, relatively shallow. 
Now, I don't know Lake Erie as well as I, uh, I know some of the stuff about the, the upper lakes, but my understanding is that there have been some instances of dead zones, especially in the lower lakes, uh, perhaps not as, uh, uh, for as long a period of time or as prevalent uh, as you might find in places like the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, but, but yes, there is concern, and there have been some instances of lowered oxygen, as I understand it. Um, that may also be a question we can revisit with, uh, uh, with Russell and Carmen. Okay. Um, someone had asked, they often say something like, less than 5% of the oceans have been explored. Is this also true of the Great Lakes? Well, let's see, less than 5%. Uh, certainly, it's a lot easier to explore stuff that doesn't have water over the top of it. Uh, so um, we may not be quite at 5%, but in terms of uh, what we don't know about the Great Lakes, I would say um, it is certainly something greater than 50%. We don't know, we don't know about the Great Lakes. I, I, you know, we have visited lots of parts of the Great Lakes. That doesn't necessarily mean we have an understanding of them. And it's often assumed that you know, if you take a sample in a couple of places or you take enough samples, uh, that you actually are getting a good picture. But I guess in terms of the amount of, uh, of lake bottom, let's say, that we've actually explored, um, it's probably somewhere around that 5 to 10 percent uh, uh, level. In terms of, of water, the actual liquid water masses themselves, we probably have a little better handle just because um, there tends to be some mixing and, uh, you know, while you can't make absolute and definitive uh, statements about the entire water mass based on a, um, a series of samples, uh, we, we may well have a better handle on some of that than they do in the oceans. But it's not, okay. you know, it's not 60 percent. Okay. <laughs> um, from a policy perspective, is there a trend to reduce overdevelopment in the areas of concern that you were discussing? Uh, <clears throat> you know, so much of development, and in terms of policy, so much of development is uh, uh, locally controlled. And um, so much of uh, what goes on in those areas depends on local ordinances, uh, setback ordinances for erosion, uh, I would say, if anything, we have done a good job uh, in the Great Lakes, as well as I think in other parts of the, the country, in terms of reducing the, the point sources of pollution that are related to industrialization, urbanization. Uh, it's been much tougher to deal with the, uh, the diffuse or the non-point sources. Um, much harder to, to regulate those sorts of things. And um, it really does amount to having people who are knowledgeable and in positions where they can make policy. I think if there's one thing that uh, we may see, it's that uh, to date, uh, in, in Jenny's presentation, to date scientists have not been as active as they could be in terms of providing input to policymakers, and I think we have to change that. So um, I would say that right now we probably, except on a broad brush sort of approach, we don't have all of the policy that we need in place. Okay. Um. I had a question, and it seems to have disappeared. But I think um, somebody was asking, or wanted to ask something about what was the name of the last glacier um, that moved through the area. I didn't see the whole question. I don't know if they retracted it or not. But well, they, yes, the last, I mean, that was the question. The, the last glaciation is referred to as the Wisconsin glaciation. So there were a series of glaciers that that moved over the, uh, the upper Midwest here. 
uh, the last one of which was referred to as the Wisconsin. Okay. Um, let's see. Does anyone else have any questions? See if they pop up or not. I know I have one. Um, I remember reading something about the invasive species of the quagga mussels having an effect on the um, shorebirds. Was there, uh, was there wasn't there a link between the quagga mussels and one type of the shorebirds, and you were having um, sort of mass die mass dying off of, of shore shorebirds along one of the the lakes? I am not familiar with that specifically. Um, as far as I am aware, it was not a Lake Michigan issue. Um, it may, that may be. Maybe something that we can uh, dig into a bit for the next presentation for Russell and Carmen. I hate to 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 put that um, more on them, but I you know I can tell you that um, there certainly are positives and negatives to having those zebra mussels, quagga mussels. There have been some. Um, I, I haven't heard of large die-offs, uh, although I'm not saying they haven't occurred, uh, but. We do get die-offs of, um, of ducks uh, from botulism. Uh, not so sure about shorebirds, but uh, certainly shorebirds, ducks, uh, they make a living harvesting some of those mussels. And we have seen, just based on my observations, we have seen significant increases in wintertime populations of diving ducks here off of the uh, southeastern Wisconsin shoreline with the advent of zebra mussels and quagga mussels because those ducks can now find a very adequate food supply uh, throughout the winter. And so we see uh, large rafts of, uh, of diving ducks. We see some, uh, we don't see as many puddler ducks just because, because of ice cover. But um, those animals would be susceptible if um, something like a botulism were to become prevalent in the uh, in the mussels or other components of their food source along the shoreline. And we may have seen some of that um, related, but I don't recall, at least in this area, large die-offs. OK. Uh, we have a question that's asking, why is the Great Lakes Basin important to students from an ocean environment? Well, um, <clears throat> as I... Um, as I hope I uh, showed just a bit, these are very, very large bodies of water that are studied in pretty much the same way as oceans. They're tributary to the oceans. Uh, and so we learn, as we learn about interactions and mechanisms uh, that occur in the oceans, that may help us study the Great Lakes and vice versa. Um, so. You know, I think we can learn from large bodies of water uh, and the interactions that occur in those large bodies of water, whether they are oceans or freshwater bodies like the Great Lakes. Certainly, um, we have become something of the poster child for invasive species. And uh, we've learned a lot about invasive species uh, with the advent of the, uh, the dry scented mussels. And so some of the lessons that we learn here may well have an impact or uh, serve as examples or serve as a knowledge base for some of the things that go on in uh, estuarine harbors, for example, or estuarine wetlands. Uh, so I think we can learn a lot from, from one another. OK. Um, does anyone have any last questions to ask Jim? If so, uh, type them in. Oh. Someone's asking, um, oh, where'd it go? What actions are being taken to control the mussels? Well, <clears throat> the primary uh, approach is not so much related to the mussels. I think uh, um, once well, what we found is that once you've got an invasive species established, the story really has to play out. Uh, there are some invasive species where you may have some biological, some chemical, some physical control. But we were not able to find something like that with zebra mussels. I think what we're looking at more is how do we prevent 
further instances of new things coming in. And so we're looking at ballast water control, ballast water sterilization. Um, there are ballast water regulations that uh, have gone into effect and are, are changing as time goes on. So that addresses uh, one possible avenue. Uh, we also have to look at um, regulating import of species uh, for aquaculture, for aquarium trade, those sorts of things. Uh, and we have to look at barriers and how we prevent uh, critters from moving around obstacles, around barriers uh, by uh, avenues such as, as canals or um, we also are in Wisconsin looking at cleaning our boats and our boat trailers better because what we found after the invasion of zebra mussels into uh, the Great Lakes, we were finding them in our inland lakes and they were getting there because they were being transported on boat hulls and in aquatic vegetation that was draped over uh, boat trailer axles and, and bunks. And so there is regulation now that also uh, addresses uh, having to clean those things before you move uh, water and boats from one place to another. So we are looking at regulation. We are looking at uh, various kinds of techniques to prevent stuff getting in. It's much easier to prevent something from getting in in many ways than it is to get rid of it once it's here. So it's the ounce of prevention, pound of cure sort of uh, approach. Um, you were speaking about ballast water. Someone had asked, um, who has responsibility for enforcing ballast water regulations? Uh, I believe on the, in the U.S. it's the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, they're the ones that established the regulations and um, they would deal with, with international shipping. Uh, we also have to address uh, ballast water issues as our own boats. Our U.S. and Canadian boats move through the Great Lakes, and so um, that would also have to be a matter of regulation and enforcement. And I'm not sure where that that stands right now, but uh, my understanding is it's the U.S. Coast Guard that has the uh, uh, the lead on ballast water regulation. Okay, have there been any success stories regarding remediating invasive species? <clears throat> well, I think the uh, one of the success stories is probably the uh, the sea lamprey, the sea lamprey, uh, invasive primitive fish from the Atlantic Ocean got into the Great Lakes, the Upper Great Lakes, uh, Lake Michigan, probably the late 30s, and um, really caused significant additional pressure on the largest predator, the, the lake trout, the largest native predator in, uh, in the upper lakes. Sea lamprey populations grew rather quickly and there was a, uh, after a period of research, it was discovered that the sea lamprey uh, laid its eggs in, um, in streams that had certain water quality conditions and that the larvae would hatch out into, or the eggs would hatch out into a, an immature form that was non-parasitic. That non-parasitic form lived in the mud of the streams for um, three to five years, and it was possible with a very specific chemical treatment to actually kill the vast majority of those larval lamprey before they were able to metamorphose into the parasitic form and go back out into the big waters. That really reduced pressure on some of the largest fish species. Numbers of sea lamprey came down dramatically, but it's an expensive uh, proposition to continue to provide that chemical into those streams. And that's the positive side is we were able to find a control mechanism which greatly reduced the population of sea lamprey the, the flip side, though, is that over the last uh, few decades, since the advent of the Clean Water Act, uh, we have done a good job of cleaning up streams. And now there are streams that, probably back in the 70s, were not suitable for sea lamprey spawning and colonization. 
uh, those streams are now cleaner and uh, we don't necessarily have the money in the program to treat those streams. So sea lamprey numbers have come back up. So I count it as a success story in that we were able to find a suitable control mechanism. The downside, though, is that uh, cleanup was, at least in terms of sea lamprey, somewhat counterproductive in that it created more habitat. Uh, and the expense has not allowed us to add those streams. So it's a two-edged sword. Um. <laughs> we had a question asking, you know, are all the indigenous species known so we can tell if something is invasive? Well, again, I think we would end up going to, um, to look at the smallest stuff in terms of um, whether, you know, what we know about it and, and whether we've cataloged it. I think we've done a pretty good job over the years of cataloging fish species, uh, lots of the zooplankton species, uh, crustacean, uh, mollusk species. Um, but I think when you get into the, uh, the bacteria, the viruses, uh, some of those kinds of things, I'm not sure we've had the technology until just recently to really go in depth uh, in looking at those things and, and uh, speciating them. So I think the sm the smaller the critter is, the less likely we are to have a good compendium of information on whether it was native, whether it's invasive, whether it's a recent introduction. Um, I think that's probably where we are. Okay. And the last question was, um, is there an invasion of purple loose strife in the Great Lakes? Certainly in the Great Lakes region, there is an invasion of purple loosestrife. We, uh, we have a number of plants that are inhabiting wetlands. Uh, purple loosestrife is one of those things that uh, it's, it's certainly in the Great Lakes. It's in the Great Lakes drainage basin. It's not, uh, it's not an aquatic species in that it doesn't live in open water, if you will, or root itself in, um, in shoreline areas. It's, it's a wetland species more than anything. Um, and one of the things, and, and this is another avenue by which species get in, purple loosestrife was introduced as an ornamental. It's a very beautiful plant, but it, uh, it really can take over certain wetland areas depending upon conditions. So do we have it in the area? You bet. Um, we have, uh, you know, a number of invading plant species, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a tall grass that we're seeing more and more of in our, our swales and uh, uh, ditches and, and wetland areas. Uh, so uh, while you know, not living truly in the waters of the Great Lakes, it certainly they certainly do live in the, the wetland areas, the tributary areas around the Great Lakes. And we count purple loosestrife as one of those invasive species that uh, uh, you know, certainly has an aquatic component. There is a biological control for purple loosestrife. Uh, there's a beetle that has been used successfully in some areas that attacks the plants and can reduce numbers. But again, it takes, uh, takes a concerted effort and a program to raise those beetles and to get them out into those areas. And so it's not a... Uh, uh, a program that is uh, extremely widespread or that really is likely to take all purple loosestrife out of the, the picture. Okay, I think that was our last question. Um, there were some other questions, but they are ones that I can take care of. Um, so first of all, I'd really like to thank Jim uh, for presenting tonight. Like again, I said I think he did a really nice overview of the Great Lakes and freshwater science, which I think our students will need a bit of a primer on since they study mostly for marine science. Um, I'm going to show you right now, if I can, my screen so that you can see. I'm going to show you where the... that'll work. Okay, maybe it's not. <laughs> Let's try this here. Um, okay, here we go. 
see, can it, can people see my screen yet? No. Um, give me one second. I will try Internet Explorer, see if that works any better. I was just going to show you our website so that you can find where we will post the presentations. Let me try now. Okay, I apologize. I do not know why it won't share my screen. Um, if you go to www.nosb.org, that is our main website, there is a sort of scrolling um, image at the top and it will show you sort of a, a new story about our webinar series. If you click there, it will take you to our webinar page where we have listed each of our presenters um, as well as when they're going to present. And that is where we will be posting the recordings of the webinars. So for those of you that want to share this information with your classes or your students, um, we will hopefully get the webinar recording up there tomorrow. Um, and then if any of our presenters provide us with either the PowerPoint of their presentation or any other documentation um, or supporting information, we'll also uh, put that up on the website as well. So, oh, okay. Amanda was helping us. Um, <laughs> she's showing you the website right now. So you can see if you just click on our link for the professional development um, site, if you scroll down, you'll see the information about each of our presenters. And you can click on the name of the presenter to find out more information about them, um, such as their background and a brief description of their uh, presentation. And that is where we will be posting um, a recording of the webinar. And you can also, if you go back to the main screen, um, we will have Carmen Aguilar-Diaz and Russell Cool. They will be presenting on invasive species. We haven't narrowed down the date and time just yet, but we will have that posted as soon as possible. So I would say after the holidays, make sure you come back and check to see about our next two to three presentations. And as, same as tonight, um, there will be a link that says, you know, to join this webinar, please go to this link and you would just need to click on it. So um, again, I thank everyone for participating. I know sometimes it's hard this late at night. Um, and again, I'd really like to thank uh, Jim. So let's see. Somehow Jim is now muted, but hopefully he can hear me. <laughs> um, I can hear you. I just so again, everybody, oh, there he is. Okay. Um, if you'd like to say any last remarks, Jim, here's your choice, or here's your chance. Otherwise, everybody, it was uh, very nice of you to participate, and we hope that we will have you participate in the next webinars. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening. Okay, so I got all the participants off now, so um, is Jim still there? Am I still on? Yep, you're still there. Thank you so much, Jim. I hope that did what you wanted it to do. I, I Like I said, I think it's uh, it was really great that we have the kids... Um,